question of what it does in us, uh, you know, as right. a neurotransmitter is, is uh, you know, another fascinating area. Exactly. That's where I was going to go next is we, it's expressed, you know, it exists inside our bodies, right? And in small amounts in our brains. And it's very strange that one of the most, you know, profoundly psychoactive substances in nature exists in our, in our brains. And, and we have no, we currently have no theories as to what it's doing there, right? And the way that I, I guess I tend to think about it, um, it'd be good to, to see if, if you think this is reasonable is given that it's, you know, it's, it's so widespread through nature that it's, it's not that it has a particular function. I think you already alluded to this. It kind of very much matters which, which members of the ecosystem are kind of signaling to each other. You know, so DMT right. and things are already on the scene when they've been around a lot longer than we have been. And similar to, oh, to, to bacteria and fungi, it's their world. <laughs> and then we come along yeah. and then we, we, ha we kind of, evolution uses a kind of grab bag of whatever's on the scene, right? Whether it's serotonin or DMT and probably does a bunch of different complex processes that it's kind of all tied up with, which I think is probably why maybe we can't find a nice neat story as to what it's doing in, in mammals like ourselves. Well, yeah, uh, it, it, you're, you make the good point that these tryptamines, uh, DMT, serotonin, uh, psilocybin, all of these were around in nature millions of years, tens of millions of years before there was any mammal on the scene or any yeah. complex nervous system to, uh, to interact with. So they had functions if you look at the phylogeny of serotonin, serotonin is a neurotransmitter. It's also, of course, it's a neurotransmitter. It's also widespread in plants and has functions. And uh, it's it, it, based on the sort of the molecular, you know, the, the genetic traits of it, it's thought to be the one of, it's thought to be the oldest neurotransmitter. It, in fact, it may be, have been present at the dawn of life, you know, uh, possibly even before life became cellular, you know, which is a damn long time ago, right? 3.8 billion years and, and serotonin has been around, um, uh, you know, and, and psilocybin similarly, probably not, not that long ago, but around 75 million years ago. And serotonin, uh, uh, psilocybin is a, interesting uh, case because uh, some recent discoveries show that it, it is propagated through the fungal kingdom by, uh, by uh, uh, so-called horizontal gene transfer. So this, this is one reason why there are over 200 species of, uh, of mushrooms that contain psilocybin. And so they're not all that closely related to each other. You know, so uh, so what is the function of psilocybin in nature? Well, it, it's pretty clear now that one of its functions is basically to drive insects crazy. <laughs> it, it, it interacts with insects and it, uh, you know, insects are attracted to eating mushrooms. And uh, in some way, sometimes it's in the mushroom's interest you know, to be eaten. Other times it doesn't want to be, but in either case, insects consuming mushrooms uh, uh, will, will facilitate spore distribution, you know, and, and the fungus's agenda is to grow and to spread and reproduce. So anything that facilitates spore distribution, uh, you know, is a good thing. And, and it, 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 it may be an attractant to certain insects, or it may be a repellent. Some people have speculated that insects, uh, you know, consume this thing, and then they just they become stone. They they lose their way. They don't know how to way, find their way home, and so on. So in that, <laughs> I, I've like some people, you know, yeah. And, yeah. and so uh, maybe this is what it's doing. Okay. Uh, and you know, anyway, I'm off on on a tangent here, in terms of what it's doing in the brain, uh, you know, for a long time, there's been speculation about the pineal gland and, and you know, that the pineal gland is the third eye and the pineal gland uh, secretes DMT as well as melatonin and, and all that. 
And that's what it's all about. If you're familiar with Rick Strassman's speculations that, you know, under states of stress, like death, for example, yeah. the, the, you know, the melatonin can kick in, or I mean, the, the pineal gland can kick in and produce enormous amounts of DMT that, you know, in response to that stress response. So that's when you see the other worlds opening up and you go through the tunnel and all of that stuff, right? There's new information. It seems like that that's a nice theory, but that's probably not what's going on because uh, Dave Nichols, who I'm sure you're familiar with, he's mm-hmm. been a big debunker of this idea. And he says, well, basically the, the pineal gland can't produce enough DMT in concentrations high enough that could activate these receptors. But there's new information that's come out that shows that actually DMT is present throughout the brain and in fairly substantial concentrations. It's just another neurotransmitter, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, in that context, you could say, well, my God, it's a psychedelic, but maybe, but, you know, in, in, at, at super physiological concentrations, but maybe at normal concentration, it functions just like serotonin or dopamine or norepinephrine. It's just one of those. And uh, there is uh, a reason to think that under extreme stress states, that DMT is one of the responses to the to stress, you know, and and that uh, it's synthesized. For example, when you're having a heart attack or a stroke, most of the DMT in the body is actually in the lungs, and the lungs can kick in. It's another interesting thing about it is it's 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 uh, it finds its way into the brain through active transport, and mm. uh, that's very uh, that's. That's very unusual, especially for a, a charged compound like like it would be. And uh, uh, so you know it. So and it, it's 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 antioxidant. And there's reason to think that it's neuroprotective. That actually, when you're having a stroke, you know the brain's response is to shut down to protect your, you know, to protect the brain from anoxia and uh, uh, oxygen deprivation and and DMT can have that protective effect. Uh, You probably know the work of E.D. Freska Freska? Mm -hmm. Freska on this. Have you read any of that stuff? (laughs) Yeah. So I think this is reasonable. You know, I think we're beginning to sort it out. not me, because I'm not doing any research. I'm just talking, but uh, <laughs> other people are looking into this. We've and, been thinking uh, about this stuff for decades, so it's it's great to have your your input on it as well, even if you're not actually doing the the experiments. Well, um, yeah, nor nor do I pretend to necessarily <laughs> understand the date of the state of yeah. the art. But but uh, active research is going on, and there's a yeah. uh, there's a, a gentleman that uh, I've done some. Uh, podcasts with and some things John Chavez and he's kind of a uh, uh, he's I guess you could say he's a a self-taught neuroscientist and he has written very interesting books one is called the questions for the lion tamer and he has a website called DMT quest if I could spell it right Camp. There you go. And uh, he's developed some very interesting ideas about endogenous DMT. DMT being one of a number of neural factors that are stimulated by extreme stress states like oxygen deprivation, you know, uh, uh, and and he's a big fan of uh, Imhoff and and Right. you know, uh, Imhoff. And, you know, people have been, uh, you know, reaching for altered states through extreme alterations of the physiology for a long time. I mean, many of these yogic traditions and shamanic traditions are all about that. 
and he claims with good evidence that part of the picture is to raise internal levels of things not only like DMT, but also opiates, you know, the enkephalins, endorphins, and other types of neurotransmitters. Uh, he would be a great person for you to interview, mm. by the way. I, I, yeah. he's, he's a self-taught neuroscientist, but sometimes self-taught, you yeah. know, is the best kind. And, uh, you know, he's, he's got some very good ideas that are not crockpot, you know, they're, they're, shall we say speculative, but uh, uh, better support in a lot of ways than some of the pineal theories about DMT. Right. Yeah, so I think it's it's good that you clarified as well. You know, use the word speculative when you're talking about the the um, pineal gland claims, um, because yeah, I think they were always um, Rick Strassman himself. I think is is at pains to emphasize that he was very clear that he was speculating when he said that in, in his work, um, and it kind yeah. of it took it took on a life of its own. I think, and people now repeat it as if it's kind of scientifically proven.